Hey everybody, welcome back to Recordology. This is gonna be awesome because I might have made the best thrift store haul of my life. I picked up a Technics direct drive turntable and yes, it works. And you will not believe the price I paid for it. You're not gonna to wanna to miss this. Welcome to Wreckitology! Behold, what may be arguably the best thrift store find of my thrifting career. So, is it a career? Hobby. Anyway, I picked this up at a thrift store last weekend for, drumroll please, $19.95. You can't beat that. This is, yes indeed, a Technics turntable. It might I say that I have become a bit of a fanboy for Technics. Unlikely, right? Don't you just review Crosleys and crap like that? No, we review all kinds of things. Hundreds of turntables, vintage, retro, modern, etc., etc., etc. High end, not so much. Low end, yeah, quite a bit. Mid range, yeah, we've done some mid range. This is a beautiful turntable, but I just have really learned to appreciate the design aesthetic and the quality of a Technics turntable. And when you get one for a good price or free, which has happened to me before, it's a thing to get excited about. So when I came across this SLD35 direct drive automatic turntable system, my first Technics direct drive, I was excited. So I walk into the Goodwill that day on this fortuitous day uh, about a week ago, and I see this guy intently looking at what looks like to be a record player. And I'm like, oh man, I hope it's not a good one. I get close and I see it's a Technics from like a mile away. I could tell this just by the design was a early to mid eighties Technics turntable. And he was looking up the value on his phone. He was looking at it real good. I'm like, oh, this guy's totally gonna take this. And he was eyeballing me to make sure that I wasn't gonna come in and snatch it, which I was keeping a safe distance and pretending to be interested in the crock pots. And he walked away. He went on to shop for something else. So I, I walked up, looked at it for half a second and took it. I'm like walking up to the register to see what I got, what model it is, 20 bucks. You know, you had me at Technics. So that's how I got this thing. And I got home and I gave it the once over and I realized that the most important things were working just fine. It did need a couple of things as we'll see here in a minute, but it pretty much was uh, ready to go, which was very exciting again for 20 bucks. You can't go wrong. You literally can't go wrong. So that's how I got this. Now let's take a closer look. So the SLD35 would probably be considered an entry level direct drive turntable. Although I feel like that term entry level extends way past the actual entry level because there are some mighty fine turntables that is all you would ever really need that a lot of people say, oh, it's a good entry level one. In actual, it's just a good turntable. Okay, that's my personal opinion. But again, I come from low down on the turntable totem pole. So what do I know? This, again, early 80s, probably my guess, 82, 81 to 84-ish is my guess. Glad to see it's got a dust cover. Will this fit the SL BD22 that I've got? Not 100% sure, nor would I necessarily want to do that. But I, the thought did cross my head. It's got some scratches and it's missing a clip back here, but it at least it's intact. Yeah, as you can see, that clip in the back is just disintegrated. In fact, whoever donated this also donated the remnants of that clip, which I actually found out you can 3D print a replacement clip for these. So that's an interesting project for another day. But I still would rather have even a broken hinge dust cover, cover than no dust cover, right? So also just loosely in here is what looks to be a grounding wire. It's got a spade connection on one side and then I don't know what you would call this on the other. But good to see that as well. Being an early 80s vintage turntable, it will not have a built-in preamp. So we'll need to provide that. No problem. Was expecting that for any vintage turntable. And uh, yeah, let's take a closer look at the uh, control panel down here. Okay, so this shares a lot of similar controls to other Technics turntables. Um, so you've got the speed switch down here. You've got the pitch adjust right here and the indicators for which strobe markings on the side of the platter indicate for different speeds and uh, power as well. And we've got a little plastic prism that reflects the light. It'll be a red light onto the side of the platter. 
That's important to me because one thing that I realized the further I get into this hobby is that for me, perfect accurate speed is one of the most important things. I decided that I don't care for turntables as much that don't have pitch control and better yet, a strobe to verify that pitch and speed. So for me, this is a pretty much a must have at this point. This is not a stacker. It is a fully automatic turntable, as you can see there, SLD35 direct drive automatic turntable system, but it's not a stacker. So there is no adjustment slider like there is on my SLB5 right there for how many records are stacked because it's designed to play one record at a time. It's got a cueing switch and then the start and stop switch right there. Very, very similar design aesthetic um, that you have on the SLB5, which is perfectly fine by me. And uh, let's take a look around back. Okay, looking at the back, we've got the label right there, Matsushita Electric Industrial. Obviously, this is Panasonic's higher-end brand. And on the left down there on the bottom, you can see the RCA output jacks and the little receptacle for this grounding plug. Again, an interesting style. You guys tell me in the comments, is this pretty common? I don't know if I've seen one of these before, but it plugs in there. And then on the other end, we'll plug into the, uh, the ground post or terminal on the preamp. And then on the right, we've got the uh, receptacle for the power supply, AC power supply. It just uses one of these, which it did come with in this case. I was glad for that. While we're back here, you can see the construction of that clip over here and that it's just totally missing here. But we do have the spring, so I feel like it could be repaired, although I'm not gonna do that in today's video, but it's something to note anyway. Okay, so the bottom is a plastic construction. By the way, this unit has a lot of heft to it. There is a lot of weight to the unit. It does not feel light or cheap whatsoever. We do have a couple of holes right here. I'm assuming those are speed adjustments for the motor. We've got these cupped rubberized feet that kind of look like a Reese's peanut butter cup there. <laughs> and uh, for some reason, the ones on the back are, are not black. I don't know if this is the natural color and these ones were, you know, specified black. So they'd match this from the front a little bit better, but those all seem to be in good shape. Nothing too exciting. Uh, I don't think they're adjustable. Maybe they are. Mostly they're just a bit flexible. It feels like it has good adhesion to a smooth surface like this. Serial number, warning sticker, and then molded into the case itself are the uh, basically what tells you where the phono jacks are, the AC power supply. That's about it. We do get a little glimpse of the plinth here. It is a molded, what is most likely an ABS plastic. No big deal whatsoever. And I don't know, this probably indicates closer to what that original color looked like before it was painted silver. There is some slight oxidation going on on the uh, painted or prepared surface of the plinth, but not as bad as some other units we've seen like that Toshiba. Uh, but most of them have a little, there's just a hint of yellowing here and there. I don't know if it really comes across on camera, but basically we've got that 80s silver color and it's in pretty good cosmetic condition. There's a little scuffing down here. The sticker uh, with all of the uh, branding and everything on it is in good condition. And that, again, is very identical to the SLB5, very similar, I should say. And um, yeah, let's kind of dig in here. So if this is the strobe light, what is this? What is this? Is that, it looks like a little tower uh, with a light on it. Now, if I look closer, it's got these grills on the back. I'm not sure if they serve a functional purpose, but that is some sort of either light or optical system. And my guess is it has something to do with these guys right here. You will notice that we it indicate to the unit itself what speed the record is playing, but not what size. So there are turntables that use a simple button press to tell uh, there's like a little switch that when you put a seven inch record on it, one of the two switches is pressed and therefore it knows it's a seven inch record and therefore knows where to drop the stylus. There are other kinds that shine a light through and I'm guessing that's what we have here because there's nothing protruding here. So these are most definitely light sensors and depending on whether or not one or both are blocked, it then knows where to drop that stylus. And I think that's pretty darn ingenious. That is a very, very cool thing. It does have a rubber platter mat. It's a thick rubber platter mat and there's just openings where those uh, sensors are. On the back here we see 
the molding itself and I'm glad this one's in good condition. I'm not sure why there's these ridges here. I'm not sure what function that serves, but this does lay flat. Now on the platter itself, they do protrude, but again, once that platter mat is on it, it evens it out. So this unit here is that light sensor array as it were. Now there's no E-clip, C-clip. I know I've called it a hundred different things. There's no clip on this spindle so far as I can tell. That being said, it doesn't want to come off and I don't feel like forcing it off. So I'm not going to. Um, but there's a couple things we can see if we peek through these openings. There's a couple of trim pots down there as well. And if we move it over here, we can look over in this vicinity here near the tone arm and see a little bit of, of what's going on behind the scenes there. But we've seen these automatic turntable mechanisms quite a bit. There's a, there's a clip right there that could be taken off for servicing. But yeah, everything seems to be in good condition. While we're here, here's a kind of close look at that optical sensor. Just fascinating to me. That's pretty advanced technology in my opinion, at least as far as turntables go. Okay, so this is almost identical to the gimbal on the SLBD22. And it is just, it's solid. I mean, this thing is <laughs> completely solid. There's no give up, down, left, right, forward or back whatsoever. You see a little wiggle there. That's literally the entire unit pivoting slightly on those feet. But this thing is just craftsmanship, 100% quality, just amazing. And you can see the counterweight, you unscrew it right here, and then it positions it, according to those lines there, at three different settings, depending on the cartridge that you have, which is really, really neat. We've got a little plastic dial here for the anti-skating setting and again there's only three values which is pretty interesting that it specifies three exact values rather than just you know one through five or whatever we do have a queuing lift shelf right here with a rubber inlay although it's either a plastic inlay actually or a hardened rubber inlay that's pretty smooth but that's okay because an automatic turntable the tone arm needs to be able to slide on that a little bit so if it's not like a really tacky rubber, that's okay. And um, yeah, again, plastic plinth, and this is gonna be a plastic base, but the parts that count, the gimbal, the tone arm, those are going to be metal. Traveling down the tone arm here, we've got a plastic clip right there. And I knew when I was at the store, I was like, oh, this thing needs a stylus. But then when I got it home, I looked and I'm like, oh, okay, we need a little bit more than a stylus. We need a whole cartridge. And yes, this does require a P-mount cartridge, which they are rarer than a regular half-inch mount SME-style cartridge. If it took an SME cartridge, I could have been you know, up and running in two minutes because of the fact I've got you know, extras or I could borrow one off another turntable. As it happens, I only have one other P-mount turntable and it's my SLBD22 and I just didn't feel like stealing from it. So I purchased a new cartridge for it. This is a, um, it's either new old stock or a used Audio-Technica, what is this, the AT320, which is discontinued, but it does have a new fan steel stylus on it. So that white housing is the new stylus housing. So it's an older cartridge with a new stylus. So that works for me. These usually go for eh, 30, 40 bucks. I got this for like 18.95 on eBay. It was a really good deal. It was the best, cheapest way to get a basically a new P-mount cartridge. Audio-Technica still makes a P-mount cartridge. It's, it looks identical to this, but it's got a different model number, and um, it's a little bit more. I think you can get a, the cheapest brand new one is like 31 bucks out the door. So I saved about 10 bucks by going this route, but it is sealed, and it comes in this. I don't. It's probably new old stock based on the packaging, and, and that'll be fine. That'll be perfect for our needs now if you're not familiar with p-mount basically you don't have to align it like you do a standard cartridge standard cartridge you just plug it in and the only thing you need to do is uh, uh take this little screw this little thread out on the side put the plug the cartridge in and, and tighten it back down and it's already aligned and ready to go so this will track at 1.25 grams these are a japan made phono cartridge and really sound good. Like I said, I've got this on the SLBD22. For an Audio-Technica, whose cartridges usually sound pretty neutral, 
this sounded warm. This sounded great to me. I really enjoyed it. I'm talking about the other one I have. So I was excited to uh, replace it with the same one. Now that I'm looking at that, I'm not 100% sure if that's the fan steel branding on the bottom. This will be a diamond stylus with an aluminum cantilever for use uh, micro groove records only, of course. Next, I'm going to take the screw out that's already in this because the screw belongs to the cartridge, just like on any phono cartridge. Could probably be reused, but I'm not going to try. Yeah, so I'm going to take that old one out because this one has its own. And there's a nut on the other side. Now, does the nut, this is the first time I've ever mounted a P-mount cartridge. I've used P-mount before, but I've never mounted one. So there's a little slot there. So I guess I guess I am going to have to uh, deal with the nut as well. So maybe a little more tricky than expected. I should probably have the stylus housing on when I'm doing this. There's not really a reason to have it off. So I'm going to put this guy back on. Because a clumsy person as I am, there will be a mistake made if there's any feasible way to do so. Okay, so we got our screw off, and now I'm just going to gently insert it. There's no give yet, and just a tiny bit of tension there at the end. Now we should be able to insert the screw on this side and tighten it to that nut. Okay, that was easy. It tightened right into this and I didn't need the nut. There's actually no hole on the other side, so it's got its own receptacle there, which is good. So I'll hold on to this nut in case I need to put it on another record player in the future. I'll put that in a little plastic case. So we should be ready to go. So let's plug it in and do a functionality test. Uh, for a record for today's uh, demonstration, we're gonna do a direct feed sound test with some music, but just for a functionality test, I thought it'd be fun to use this cool record I picked up not too long ago, Finley's Heroes. The 1972 Oakland Athletics, as you guys may or may not know, over the last year I've kind of gotten back into baseball and baseball card collecting. So I've picked up a few of these uh, baseball records, which are a ton of fun. Okay, so we put a 12-inch record on. We're going to say 33 RPM, and both of those optical sensors are covered. So now the unit knows that we are playing a 12-inch record, and when I hit, uh, let me put the cueing switch down. When I hit start, it should drop the needle right there at the beginning. And you can see the uh, little tower in the back light up and it, the sensors see no light coming back through. So they know this is a 12 inch record and we go ahead and drop our stylus in the right place. Good descend, it's got a good descend. So there's still some uh, somewhat viscous fluid in the back there on the uh, piston, which is a good thing. And let's go ahead and lift it up with the Q switch. And it did come up. It's hard to see from this angle, but it did come up. And I'm going to put it into the runout groove. And it should auto return. Okay, I might have put it a little too far into the runout groove. So let me, uh, let me try this again. Let me let it go through its cycle. You don't want to interrupt the automatic cycle of a turntable by <laughs> spinning things and by moving things around until it's gone through with its routine. So I'm going to go ahead and put the uh, stylus near the end of the record there and let it hit that run out and it should come on home on its on its own, which would be good. These are all measurements and adjustments that should be made at the factory and hopefully are, are maintained through ownership throughout the years. That works great. A little herky jerky on the way back, but so it didn't come with a 45 adapter. That means we have a good excuse to use this. Put that right there and let's just think about that for a second. Have you ordered your official Recordology 45 adapter yet? Check out the link in the video description below. And by the way, thank you to everybody that supported the channel by buying their own, or maybe two, some people have bought two of the 45 adapters. Interesting, there's no peg for it back there. There's no place to put a 45 adapter, but that's okay. So we've got a seven inch record on there. I'm gonna change the speed to 45. And I'm going to hit start, and now it's going to see one of those sensors covered, but not the other one. And therefore, it knows this is a 7-inch record, and therefore, needs to move the stylus all the way to the inside to play. And it works perfectly. That's great. Now, let's move this to the run out or the lead out. Oops, I did it again. I put it too far into the run out. The thing with 7-inch uh, records, 
that you need to be mindful of when it comes to automatic or even auto stop turntables is whether or not it is rejecting too soon. Does it actually play through the end of the song? I just did it again. I pushed it too far. I need to look, you know, top down. I hear a little clicking on the return. It clicks a couple of times before it drops that tone arm. All right, so let's go ahead and put the stylus down there. It looks like it might be rejecting just a tad bit too soon. And you hear that click? Not 100% sure what's causing that. Not 100% sure. It does do what it's supposed to do, but there is likely an adjustment. If you remember those little trim pots under the platter, that's probably adjust adjustments for where the reject point should be. So that could uh, be an adjustment that needs to be made. So, but yeah, the functioning is right. That all of that is, you know, how it is supposed to be essentially in terms of the sizes, the speeds, the automatic stop and start point. Although, like I said, the reject point on seven inch may need to be brought out just a tad bit. Yeah, that's definitely rejecting a tad bit too soon. So you don't get to hear the end of the record. But again, that's an adjustment. It's not a problem whatsoever in terms of a break. It's not broken. There's no fault. It's just an adjustment. So, okay, we are ready to give it a direct feed sound test. And like I said earlier, I'm going to need a preamp. For that, I'm going to be using the IFI Zen Phono preamp, which has an AI subsonic filter, takes out distortions due to rumble. Although this platter seemed... Oh, yeah, there was one other thing that I did want to show you guys. I did want to show you one other thing. So I'm going to put the cueing switch up and I'm going to move this into position. I want to show you over here on the strobe itself. This is 45, so we're gonna be looking second to last there. It's very sensitive. The speed looks pretty darn consistent. There's not a lot of cogging. It's a very consistent locked in speed. This will use a uh, DC servo system for the uh, speed consistency. It's not, it doesn't have a quartz lock, but watch this. So I get the speed set at uh, 45, then I go down to 33, which will be at the very bottom. It'll be a little harder to see. I'm gonna need to readjust that speed, dial it in, and it's really hard to see. It's just down there in that, that little crack there, the very bottom row. So 33 is locked in, but watch, I go back to 45, and it's a little bit off, although not too far off. So ideally, these would be calibrated so you don't need to adjust speed every time you, or adjust pitch every time you adjust speed. But there's a little bit of a discrepancy. I just wanted to mention that. Not a deal breaker whatsoever. It just means you need to adjust the pitch slightly when you're switching between 45 and 33. You guys, $20 for a Technics turntable direct drive and another $18 for the cartridge that's less than $40 in to have a essentially perfectly working Technics direct drive turntable and would literally be perfectly operational once we adjust the, uh, the reject point on the seven inch record. So yeah, let's give it a direct feed sound test. I'm gonna hook everything up and we'll give it a listen. By the way, for beginners, I'm not showing speakers, but you have to have speakers for this. It does not have any built-in speakers. If you're going the vintage route, you need the preamp and then you need the powered speakers or a stereo with the phono input or line input. So let me go ahead and get that hooked up and we will give it a direct feed sound test. Okay, let me explain exactly how we have this set up here. So I've got the phono level output and the ground coming out of the turntable plugged into the IFI preamp. I decided to actually go with the uh, Zen Light, I believe it's called. It's a plastic entry level one. I was getting a little bit of buzzing with the IFI Zen. There's a lot of Wi-Fi in here. Uh, there's the type of lights that cause that type of interference. I'm not 100% sure. I was getting a little bit of buzz from that, so I went with this. Seem to be getting better luck with it at the moment. I'm using this speaker just as a local test to set my levels and also as a headphone amplifier going into my Zoom audio recorder. We're recording at 96K studio resolution, and I believe that's a 24-bit that I've got it set to right now. Uh, interestingly enough, sidebar here, uh, the Zoom recorder, even though it has a line input, it does not take a full line level signal, so you have to dumb it down with a headphone amplifier. So learn that the hard way. Hey guys, I just need to jump in really quickly here. So the record you are about to see visually is a Vinyl Moon record. However, I tried like four different songs and YouTube, YouTube keeps shutting down every single one of them. They wouldn't let me use any of it which is weird because I've used it before. So the audio we're gonna hear is from Laura Ainsworth's Top Shelf album, which is really, really cool. But in case you're wondering why 
the record doesn't match the sound, that's why. But you are hearing sound from the turntable. It's just from audio recorded at a different time as the video. And we're just gonna listen to at least part of the first track and give this guy a listen. Headphones on, you guys. This is a direct feed sound test. my friends as always thank you so much for joining me we've got a lot of fun surprises coming your way some very cool things to share with you in the coming days weeks and months that i'm very much looking forward to but that is going to do it for today so happy record honey and we'll see you next time